Today our scripture reading comes to us from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter. We'll begin reading in the 14th verse. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, See now, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command the servants who attend you to look for someone who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the evil spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you'll feel better. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me someone who can play well and bring, for them, bring him to me. One of the young men answered, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a warrior, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a kid, and sent them by his son David to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for, God has found, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever an evil spirit from God came upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it in with his hand, and Saul would be relieved, and he would feel better, and the evil spirit would depart from him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, over the next few weeks, we are going to be looking at ways that we can change our world. And I know that sounds very daunting, that idea of changing the world. And we immediately think that we're going to do something here that's going to have global impact. And, and that's possible. But what we're going to be talking about is how we can change our world the world we live in, our little world, and we know that that will have an effect. It'll have an effect on those around us. It'll have an effect on those that we encounter day by day, and, and it could set in motion a chain of events, a, a chain of changes that could affect the world. I mean, after all, remember, remember the book by Andy Andrews, The Butterfly Effect? I love the book. It's a, it's a tremendous read if you haven't ever read it. He's basically using the principle, the, the theory that a butterfly on one side of the world could flap its little butterfly wings and because of that little movement of air on the other side of the world, all the way on the other side of the world, it could cause a hurricane. One event adding to another, to another, to another, and then suddenly a hurricane wind is blowing. He tells stories in the book about people, people whose lives were maybe they weren't the most uh, well-known and their actions or their events at the time didn't seem that significant, but reality was they were flapping their little butterfly wings. And, and so generationally across the years, they have had tremendous effect. He goes through story after story after story of, of showing how one life, one decision can have long-term effect. And so we think of our lives that way. What changes can we make today in our lives that will have effect now but could even have generational effect? We can make a positive change in our world. We can touch the lives of the people around us and, and when we do that, it can change lives for generations to come. Think about how, what it could mean if if you made a positive light of change in your life and you began to shine the light of Christ into the people around you through what you did and what you said and how you act and how you react, if you were shining the light of Christ into your relationships, into your family, into your friend group, into, into your work relationships, the world around you, the world beyond, what effect could that have? It could be tremendous. The Gospel of John says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about ways that we can make changes in our lives so that we can shine the light of Christ through who we are, through what we do, so that we can shine the light of Christ into the lives of, of the people we love the most and the people we don't even know. 
And we're going to be going way back in our history as a people of faith, way back in the stories of God. And we are pulling out one of the main characters of the Old Testament. And we're looking at his life in three different increments, three different time periods. And we're looking at the life of David and having David help us to process how we can change our world. You know, he is truly a person who his life had generational effect. He's still teaching us so much about what it means to live and be in a relationship with God. Because David, in his story, the Hebrew people did not clean it up. They did not perfect it. They did not erase history or modify it. We get to see David at his best, and we see David at his worst. We see David when he is the, doing the greatest things for God, and we see David when he is, a well, a failure. We see him high and low and everything in between. And he teaches us. And today, we're looking at his life. And we think about service. And how we are all called to change our world through serving. And we're talking about his relationship with Saul. The passage that we have before us literally says, And David came to Saul... And entered his service. This is the beginning of how David is moving from being this shepherd boy in the hillside around the area of Bethlehem, moving into the service of King Saul, first as a musician, and then as the armor bearer, then as a warrior, and then as an enemy, and then as a king. But let's back up and remember how it starts. Let's remember how this connection happens between the two of them. In the previous chapter in Samuel's book, Saul loses favor with God. Saul had begun to, well, try to please people in, in, the, Israelite, in the Israelite people. He decided to please people rather than pleasing God. And that doesn't work now, and it didn't work then. And so God had made the decision that Saul would no longer be king. And so God sent the prophet Samuel out to Bethlehem and to a man named Jesse and told him, of Jesse's sons, you will find the next king for my people. And Samuel went, just like God had told him. And, and Jesse basically parades his children by, all his boys by. And, and every time when Samuel would say, this has to be the one, he's the biggest, he's the strongest, he's the smartest, he's the fastest. And God each time would go, no, that's not the one. And finally, Samuel was at the point of giving up, feeling that something, he wasn't hearing something right from God. Something had to be wrong in this when finally Jesse decided, well, I'll call my other son in. He's this little, he's my youngest son and, and he is out tending the sheep. I'll bring him in. And that was David. And David was the next king of God's people and he's anointed to be king even though he's a boy. Now, when David is anointed to be king, the Spirit of God, the blessing of God, left Saul. And Saul was tormented. This dark mood seemed to settle on him from time to time. And, and so people suggested that he needed to get help for this. And I think it's the first time in recorded history we have someone suggesting music therapy. It's a really big deal nowadays, but even in this time, somebody realized that music has a way to soothe the soul, and so that's what Saul needed. He needed music therapy to help him. And so verse 17 tells us, Saul said to his servants, provide for me someone who can play well. I guess that's the first thing we learn about service. When we look at the life of David and, and we look at this story, the first thing we learn about serving is that we serve by doing what we do well. We serve by what we do well. You know, in this passage, they said they're looking for someone who is skillful at playing the lyre. Saul says he wants someone who can play well. And then one of the servants said, I've seen the son of Jesse who is skillful at playing. Just like what we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 
The Apostle Paul says, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. We have all been given gifts. All been given gifts, things we do well. Things that we are to use in service to others. Things that we are to use in service to God's church. In service to God's kingdom and in service to the world. And God has made each of us with, with some things, some gifts planted within us that the Holy Spirit seems to open up when we choose to use them to serve. And it is amazing because we have one gift that we think we can serve with and we use that gift and the Holy Spirit opens up another gift that we can use and, and then another gift and suddenly we find that we are able to do things that we never thought we could do because we're willing to serve. But sometimes we, we really do want to pick the gift we, we have, don't we? I mean, we want to pick our gifts because some gifts are more fun than other gifts. Some gifts are more notable than other gifts. Some gifts are, are, well, they're more talked about and more bragged about than other gifts. And so sometimes we want to choose those. But if it's not our gift, it's not our gift. A while back at a church, there was a person who, she was absolutely amazing at logistics. I mean, whatever happened in the church, whatever event took place in the church, she was always there behind the scenes serving, keeping all the plates spinning, keeping all the trains on the track and everybody on schedule. She had that ability. She could always foresee the problems coming and she would be able to change course, correct course, whatever needed to happen well in advance. But one year, one year at Vacation Bible School, she decided that she wanted to do something different. She had always been in the back, doing her logistics. For once, she wanted to be in the front. And not just front and center, she wanted to do a critical part of Vacation Bible School. Now, she really wasn't an artist. She had never been a crafty person. She had never made a single trip to Michael's or Hobby Lobby. That's how, that's how uncrafty she was. But it didn't stop her from insisting that rather than logistics, she wanted to be put in charge of arts and crafts for a vacation Bible school. She read the list of all the things that were going to be needed for the different crafts for the different days. She made her first trip to a craft store, bought supplies that she thought she needed, and then the week started. Day one. They're making these little stained glass windows out of construction paper and tissue paper. And they were supposed to cut the little pieces of tissue paper and make them look like the pieces of stained glass and, and glue them on and, and make this beautiful stained glass window that they would take home and, and you know hang on the refrigerator for way too long. But it just wasn't working. It wasn't working. The glue was globbing up as she was trying to use it, and, and the tissue paper was, was balling up and, and wasn't spreading back out, and, and it really looked plain, and she couldn't figure out what was wrong. It was just terrible. And the huge mess got worse with every grade that came through her classroom. And finally, when the project was failing again in the last group of the day, one of the fifth grade girls said, can I see the instructions? You know it's bad when the fifth grade girl wants the instructions. And she read the instructions. She looked at the supplies on the table. And she said, this isn't right. The instructions clearly say that you're supposed to use tissue paper and construction paper to make the stained glass windows. Do you not know that tissue paper and Kleenex are not the same thing? They are not the same thing in the least. It wasn't her area of giftedness. It means she couldn't even naturally read the instructions and know what to do. It was not her area of giftedness. And the next year, she happily went back into the back room 
and became the logistics person again. And all the trains ran on time and all the plates kept spinning and everything was wonderful again. She was back in her area of giftedness. But haven't we all known someone like that? They, they, they want to be in the person that does shit. They want to be the person that does this. They want to be the person that does that. And so they go out there and, and do it. But it's not what they're gifted to do. But how many other times have we seen those other people? How many times have we seen that person who can take that hard task and they make it look simple? How many times have we watched someone as they did something from start to finish in record time and we didn't even know how to get started with the issue? How many times have we witnessed someone take how they are blessed and use it to be a blessing? And when we remark about it in awe or admiration, they simply look at us and go, well, that's just what I do. I know how to do this and so I... That's what I do. I want to encourage you to ask yourself, what can I do? What can I do? I mean, David did what he could do. He could play the liar. He did what he could do. What can you do? What gifts have, has God given you to serve in his name? What abilities, what talents, what skills... What resources? What is your Christ-centered purpose? When we each do what we can do, what God has gifted us to do, then we are shining the light of Christ into the lives of others around us, in our family, among our friends, our co-workers, those at school, those in the world that we encounter. It makes a difference. But we have to first ask, what can I do? How have you gifted me, God, to serve you? A few years ago, a pastor had a family, uh, a couple start attending his church. They'd just moved to town. And, and one Sunday, after they'd been attending for several weeks, they, they met in the narthex, and the man came over to the pastor and said, I just want to share something with you uh, and ask for you to pray. I've just received a, a cancer diagnosis. I'm going to be starting treatment soon. The cancer is already fairly advanced, so, but we're, we're, we're optimistic and we're starting treatments. And the pastor said he would pray with them and pray for them. A few weeks later, the pastor was in his office one day and he got a call from the wife and she said she had some hard news to share. Her husband, while he had done well with the cancer treatments early on, he had problems receiving the treatments and different things that occurred. And so they had placed him on hospice care at home. But she said, before he passes away, which we don't know when that'll be, it'd mean a lot to him and a lot to me to join the church because y'all have stood by us as we've gone through this. And of course the pastor agreed, and, and he went by as soon as he could and, and received them into membership with some of their friends standing around. The following week, the wife called. And she said, we... We'd like you to come by for a visit, and I'd like you to talk about the memorial service. I know that he wants to have it at the church, and, and I know that he wants you to lead the service, but it'd be really helpful if, if we knew what he was thinking and what he was wanting, and, and so I'd like to see if you could come and have that conversation. And of course, the pastor agreed. We, we go to those things. We do those things. So the day before he went, he called the man's cell phone. And he reminded him that he was going to be coming by. And he left the voicemail saying, I'm going to come by tomorrow, tomorrow and I'm going to talk with, I want to talk with you about your service. And I want you to think about what you would like before I get there. That way we'll, we'll, we'll have a starting place in our conversation. So the next day he got there. The man was in the hospital bed laying in, sitting in the living room because they couldn't get the hospital equipment into the bedroom. And, and so he's in the living room sitting up in a hospital bed watching television when the pastor arrives. The, the wife had stepped out to run an errand and the pastor walks in and it's just the two of them in the room. And the pastor sat down next to the bed and said, well, I know you, you know why I'm here. 
um, I've come to talk about your service and, and what you would like. And there was this long pause. It was actually long enough that it seemed really awkward. And the pastor started thinking to himself, okay, maybe he's not, maybe he's not ready. He's not at that place yet where he's ready to talk about his memorial service. And, and so the pastor's trying to decide if he should change the subject or if he should figure out how to ease into the topic so that the guy would get all right with having this conversation. And he is about to ask, do you know when your wife's going to be home uh, kind of thing? Because maybe she could help us, help him get through this. And, and before he could speak, the man cleared his throat and said, you know, I've been thinking about that voicemail what you said on the phone yesterday. And, you know, I was, as I was thinking about it, I know we just recently joined the church. And I realize I really can't do a whole lot while I'm lying here in this bed. But I thought about it. I prayed about it. And I realized that that's something I can do. I can pray. I can pray for people and, and I, can, I can write notes of encouragement to other people who are going through hard times. And so if, if you could bring me a list of the people in the church who are on the prayer list and the people in the church who need notes of encouragement written to them and maybe some note cards and some stamps, then I can do that while I lie here. And the pastor realized in that moment that in his voicemail, he didn't say, talk about your memorial service. All he said was, talk about your service. And so the pastor decided, I'll talk about the memorial service when I come back tomorrow to bring him all his supplies. And as he left, he was just overwhelmed. As he thought to himself going out to the car, here is this guy lying at home in a hospital bed in his living room on hospice, and he isn't saying, I can't do that, or I can't do anything, or what good would it be for whatever I could do? He's not even asking, what could you do for me? He's asking himself, and he's asking his God, what can I do? What do I have to offer at this moment, in this place, at this time, in, in this circumstance, with who I am, what do I have to offer? What can I do? What an amazingly blessed attitude. What if we ask those kind of questions? What can I do now? How can I help? How can I make a difference? How can I serve? When the pastor went back the next day to, to meet with the husband and the wife, to talk about the memorial service, he took, his, he took the list of prayer requests. He took the list of people for encouragement. He took the note cards and the stamps and left everything so that that man could serve as long as he could serve. In many ways throughout his life, even, even when he was king, David saw his role as one who served. David knows in, in this moment, when he goes to Saul's palace with his lyre in hand, he knows that he's already been anointed by God to be the next king of God's people. But David doesn't use that. He doesn't use that as a means to put himself first and others, including Saul, last. He doesn't hold that over Saul's head. He doesn't gloat. He doesn't brag. He serves. If you skip ahead into the future, Jesus comes into our world as one who comes in the line of David. And Jesus is a servant king. Scripture in, for, in Philippians 2, it says it beautifully. Though being the very nature of God, he didn't count equality with God as something to be grasped, but instead, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself, taking on the identity of a servant. Born in human form, he became obedient even to death. That was the identity of Jesus. 
one who serves. And he even told his disciples, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. That's the example that Jesus set before us. He changed the world by being a servant. And so can we. How would it change your world if you took on a mindset of, I want to be a servant. I want to, I want to serve wherever I am. and I want to try to help others. I want to try to shine the light of Christ by, by using my talents for God. What would, what would it change if you did that? Because you see, we change our world through service. We serve at home. We serve our spouse, we serve our family, we serve our parents, we serve our children, we serve our friends, we serve the stranger that we meet. If we want to change the world, we serve. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who's with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey and loaded it. And then David came to Saul and entered his service. David was sent to serve. Jesus was sent to serve. You are sent to serve. So today, change the world, starting with your world. Go and serve. Carry the light of Christ into the world. Serve with your giftedness. Do what you can do. Meet the needs you see. And in every place you go, and in every way you can, and in every opportunity that comes your way, go and serve using the gifts that God has given you. So ask today, what can I do? And then, go do it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, our closing hymn is number 596, O Master, let, let Me Walk With Thee. I invite you now to stand as we sing verses 1 through 3, and then verse 4 is our benediction response. <laughs>